alien language with an unbreakable code. A cryptic conundrum that sends a sinister clue. The unspeakable horror of the German corpse factories. And the British volunteers who are buried alive. A new kind of war, conflict on a scale never seen before or since. This is war at its weirdest. Incredible experiments. This has got to be one of the most bizarre weapons in the history of warfare. Oh, what is even crazier is it seems to work. <sighs> Mysterious events. It does sound crazy, but we have eyewitnesses that claim that's what happened. Unexplained phenomena. They've never seen anything like this before. When a world goes to war with itself, things get really weird. An alien language cuts across the airwaves. The US Marines have never heard anything like this before. It spreads panic amongst the troops. Have they been overrun? Are the radios in enemy hands? But this isn't Custer's last stand. This time, the Indians are riding to the rescue with a crazy idea as wild as any Western. These people are speaking the world's true unbreakable code. August 1942. US Marines are getting ready for the American assault on the South Solomon Island of Guadalcanal. Guadalcanal is the first American offensive of the Pacific War. This is a massive moment for the United States in the Second World War. This is the point where it begins, taking back the real estate that the Japanese have seized. This is payback for Pearl Harbor. On August 7th, the USS Enterprise makes a sneak attack on Guadalcanal, launching amphibious armored landers with 20,000 men on board. The Japanese are unprepared. Within 24 hours, the Americans take over the airfield on Guadalcanal and look set for victory. The American forces take Henderson Field, which is a key point on the island but they've miscalculated. Because what they've underestimated is the sheer willingness and determination of the Japanese to retake Guadalcanal. On November 13th, Japanese reinforcements arrive from the north. They bombard the already depleted US Navy and invade the island. The Japanese begin a process of feeding reinforcements to Guadalcanal and this leads to vicious clashes between the two opposing forces. The American Marines find themselves fighting the Japanese in dense jungle, hand to hand. This is now make or break. As the Marines battle with the Japanese, they keep in constant contact with each other over the radio. Suddenly, a shocking transmission bursts onto the airwaves. The Marines hear Japanese-sounding voices all over the airwaves, and they start to panic. Just imagine being in a defensive position on the jungle. You're so far away from home, you're halfway around the world. One of the only connections that you have to the rest of the men around you is the field telephone line. And suddenly, through it, you can hear someone talking in a language that doesn't sound anything like English. The Japanese somehow overrun all the airwaves, or perhaps they've taken a marine position and they're now using American radios to make their own broadcasts. It's terrifying. Of course, the sound of that language is going to make them automatically suspect that they're listening to the enemy. But the US Marines have not been defeated, just fooled by the strange voices they hear over the airwaves. These voices are not, in fact, speaking Japanese at all. And this trick has been played on them by their own side. 
In actuality, they were listening to their brother Marines talking in the greatest, the most unbreakable code that has ever been. This code came about because retaking the Pacific Theater presented the US forces with a massive challenge. War in the Pacific is a truly logistical nightmare. This is an enormous ocean dotted with lots of little islands. Communication is extremely difficult, if not impossible, unless you've got radio. And controlling the airwaves is a vital part of the American war effort. To communicate effectively, the US commanders need unbreakable codes. And these are in short supply. US intelligence is desperate for a breakthrough. In the end, they get one. But it doesn't come from a cryptographer. Instead, a civilian steps forward with an intriguing idea. Philip Johnston is the son of a missionary from California. His father used to be a missionary to a small tribe of Native Americans called the Navajo. And they used to talk this language that was basically unknown to anybody else. And this is what gives Johnston the idea. The Navajo language has a spoken tradition only. Because it's not written, no one can learn it. And because of that, it really is the perfect language to provide instant translations on the spot that could not be penetrated by anyone. Johnston presents his idea to the US Marine Corps, suggesting that this unique and virtually unknown language would make a great code. Military top brass are intrigued. They decide to run a test. Intelligence officers gather together a group of Navajo volunteers and ask them to translate and encode three lines of American typical warfare messages. Now, this normally takes 30 minutes to do, but the Navajo do the same thing in just 20 seconds. The experiment proves that the Navajo language can not only convert US military messages into fluent code, but can do it more than 200 times faster than conventional coding machines. Army recruiters are sent to Navajo settlements across the region to enlist the 30 best Navajo men they can find. Once enlisted, the Navajo soldiers set about creating a code book. But almost immediately, they face a problem. The Navajo language doesn't provide words for things like tank or machine gun or ship, obviously. So what the code talkers had to do was to create a, a word already existing in their language that could function as a metaphor for these things. The Navajo word for shark is used to mean destroyer. Kalo. Golden oak leaf signifies lieutenant colonel. Chichil bi tahoa. Iron fish becomes submarine. Beshlo. The book contains 411 code words. The Navajo soldier reads it, remembers it, then the book is destroyed. 27 Navajo Marines are sent to the front lines across the islands, including to the besieged Guadalcanal. This project was super secret. It was necessarily so because the Marine Corps wanted to set up the program and continue using it throughout the war. No one thinks to inform the Marines already on Guadalcanal. When the US Marines on Guadalcanal hear this Navajo language chattering over their airwaves, they immediately start to panic and they think that some section's been overrun by the Japanese. It's a classic military cock up. When the US commanders realize the misunderstanding, they order the Navajo code talkers to cease communication until the Marines are informed of the plan. Then, the Navajo code talkers swing back into operation. The best cryptanalysts in Japan attempted to break this code, but there was nothing that they could do. There was no book on the shelf that provided them a translation of the words that they were hearing. Suddenly, they're up against a brick wall. They can't decipher a single word. Soon, the US military gain a really strong foothold on the island. And eventually, in February 1943, the Japanese give up. 
It's a great setback for the Empire of Japan, and it's a great victory for the United States. The Navajo Code Talkers continue to play a pivotal role for the remainder of the war. The Navajo Code is in fact so successful that the US military turn to all the other Native American languages and start to use them as well. These people who had at one time been victimized by policies of the United States government demonstrated that they were patriotic American citizens by not just answering the call to serve in the American military, but then by contributing their unwritten languages toward overall victory in World War II. And they did it in code. The code is absolutely unbreakable. It's really the only unbreakable code of the Second World War. Coming up. As the Allies prepare for D-Day, Nazi agents try to predict where it will land. Clearly, the invasion plans for D-Day are one of the biggest secrets of the war. If they could make Hitler think that the invasion was coming at a different place, then they had a genuine chance of succeeding. When the plans are leaked through a surprisingly cryptic source, the Allies have no clue what to do. If the Germans got wind of this plan, the entire invasion could be throttled before it even begins. May 1944, German eyes are focused on Kent. The Germans were desperate to find out where the Allies would land. They are hunting the codes of the Allied invasion beaches. If they got those code names, it could jeopardize the entire Normandy invasion. And a sinister clue suggests they may have found them. It's amazing how just a simple puzzle almost completely ruined the plans for one of the greatest invasions of all time. May 1944, plans for the D-Day landings are being finalized. Operation Overlord is quite simply the most ambitious amphibious expedition ever mounted. The scale of it is absolutely vast. 13,000 aircraft, 5,000 ships, 160,000 men, all poised to attack just five beaches on the Normandy coast. The aim of the operation is to simply deposit Allied fighting armies on the European continent with the overall objective of the destruction of the armed forces of the Third Reich. The plan was to turn the entire tide of the Second World War. The Nazis already expect an Allied invasion. But under Operation Fortitude, they're led to believe that this invasion will start at Calais, not Normandy. This was done through a variety of ways, partly double agents were sending false information to the Germans, partly false wireless information about troops and troop movements that didn't exist, and partly through dummy tanks, dummy aircraft, dummy airfields, all sorts of decoys that the Germans were meant to think were real, but in fact never existed. If they could make Hitler think that the invasion was coming at a different time, at a different place, then they had a genuine chance of succeeding. One thing is crucial. Operation Overlord must remain a secret. Not easy, given the scale of the plan. There was a great concern that the vast spy network that was present in the United Kingdom would lead to German spies picking up information and passing it along to Berlin. There's even the story of a US general who's overheard chatting about D-Day at a cocktail party. He's immediately demoted and sent back home. MI5 is at the heart of this attempt to keep Operation Overlord a secret. As the preparations reach their peak, one agent takes time out for his daily newspaper crossword. What he finds there threatens to undo everything. The accepted story is that an MI5 agent, one morning, takes a little bit of time out of his routine to do his daily crossword. And as he's doing so, he spots a clue one of the USA, four letters. And he quickly realizes that the answer is Utah. Now, to the ordinary crossword solver, there's nothing strange about that. But there is, if you know, the code name for one of the D-Day beaches, Utah. 
Utah Beach was the westernmost of the Allied assault beaches on D-Day. This is the spot where the U.S. Army 7th Corps would conduct its supposed amphibious landing operation, spearheaded by the U.S. 4th Infantry Division. The American 4th Infantry are going to storm ashore and use it to cut off the Cotentin Peninsula because they need to seize the port of Cherbourg, which is going to be absolutely vital to supply the advancing allies as they go through France and hopefully all the way through to Germany. If the Germans got wind of this plan, then the entire invasion could be throttled before it even begins. The paper containing the bizarre crossword clue is the Daily Telegraph. MI5 decide to keep an eye on the situation. Over the next few days, yet more clues with links to the Normandy landings appear in the Telegraph crossword. On May 22nd, Omaha is the answer to the clue Red Indian on the Missouri. Omaha is the code name for the target of the US 1st Division. On May 27th, the clue solution is Overlord, code name for the whole D-Day operation. On May 30th, it's Mulberry, code name for the floating harbors used in the landings. And on June the 1st, the solution to 15 down is Neptune, code word for the naval assault phase. It is a ridiculous coincidence that all of these code words made it into the Telegraph puzzles. There's no reason to believe that the Daily Telegraph was in on it, but maybe the person operating the crossword puzzle is. MI5 knows that many of the nation's Telegraph-reading aristocracy have latent Nazi sympathies. And the Telegraph's crossword has a prior history of apparent betrayal. Two years before, in 1942, the very day before the Allies are going to launch a daring raid on Dieppe, the word Dieppe appears in the Telegraph crossword. That certainly doesn't make the Daily Telegraph look innocent, and it certainly doesn't make things look quite so coincidental now, does it? The raid on Dieppe was a disaster. The Germans were waiting for the assault force. 4,000 Canadians were killed, wounded, or taken prisoner. It seems clear that the Germans knew the Allies were coming. Was the crossword how they found out? Canadian intelligence and MI5 agents launch an inquiry, and after months of really exhaustive research, they can simply find no evidence that there's been any treachery. They can only conclude one thing. It's an utter fluke. But now the Normandy landings are just one week away, and British intelligence is convinced that the Telegraph crossword is trying to tip off the Germans. Security forces recognize that there is something going on. What could possibly be driving the Daily Telegraph to reveal these important matters of national security? What is behind this? MI5 goes into overdrive. They race to track down the crossword compiler behind the Telegraph clues. Expecting a highly trained German spy, they're shocked to find a 54-year-old schoolteacher. Leonard Dorr is at home, hard at work compiling his latest crossword as the MI5 agents burst in. Picture the scene. There's the bookish Leonard Dorr sitting at home at his desk, working away on his new crossword. And suddenly, a whole bunch of MI5 agents push their way in. It must have been the shock of his life. Leonard Dorr is arrested, protesting his innocence. He is interrogated for hours. MI5 officers demand to know why the particular words used in the crossword were chosen. A confused and indignant Dor replies, why not? Dor was absolutely furious and demanded to know which law was there to stop him using whichever words he chose. Britain was, after all, a free country. He later reflected, they turned me inside out, but they decided not to shoot me after all. In the end, the investigators can find no evidence of a spy network. They conclude that the use of code names is nothing more than a weird coincidence. The Normandy invasion goes ahead. 
resulting in an historic victory that turns the tide of the war. But could the use of all those code words truly be a coincidence? It still really just seems a little too convenient, doesn't it? It takes four decades before the bizarre truth is finally revealed. In 1984, during the 40th anniversary celebrations of the landings, property manager Ronald French comes forward with a theory. During the war, Ronald French was at a school called The Strand, where Leonard Dorr, the telegraph crossword setter, was the headmaster. Now, the school was evacuated to Surrey, where it was positioned near a US Air Force base. And Ronald French said that at that time they were close to a, a, an American base where the boys used to hang around the American soldiers. That proximity allowed some of his students to overhear discussions where troops uttered some of these words that then subsequently appear in the crossword puzzle. They would often hear words like Omaha and Utah. And when they used to go and meet Dor in the evenings, and Dor would sort of ask them, have you got any great words for me to put in my crosswords tomorrow, boys? He didn't know they were code words, but they were just words that boys heard in the area from the Americans. Not everyone believes this weird story. It's a nice story. It's a very neat story. Except it doesn't really add up, because the, the American soldiers wouldn't have known the code words for all five beaches. Operation Neptune, Operation Overlord, Mulberry for the Mulberry Harbors. It seems to me very unlikely they got in through that particular route. In fact, some historians wonder whether the whole story could be a post-war myth. I've attempted to find a newspaper where they actually show the crosswords. What you typically see is a clipping that where someone says, look, this appeared right before D-Day. What you don't see is a full broadside of an entire page that includes the paper that includes the date. People want to believe these things when there's intrigue and great background story. And I think it was under those circumstances that the crossword puzzle story took on a life of its own, and it has been living that life for 50-plus years now. Perhaps an even more incredible answer to the bizarre D-Day puzzle is still out there. Coming up, sinister German factories in World War I give rise to horrific reports. The Germans call it a Kadaververwertungsanstalt, a corpse factory. Does this mean that it is just animal bodies being burnt, or could this factory actually have a much more sinister purpose? The story of the German corpse factories contains more than first meets the eye. This is basically the story of the boy who cried wolf, but only to discover that the wolf was even more monstrous than he could have possibly imagined. A terrible burning stench issues from mysterious factories. People describe it as a dull smell, as if lime was being burnt. Rumors tell of dead bodies on a never-ending production line. They're turning corpses into fat. Is this the most disturbing story from the Great War? Or the world's first piece of fake news? This story alters the course of the war. It's 1917, and the British Navy has virtually shut down German supply lines. Only a few goods make it through the blockade, and materials needed for the German war effort are running out fast. Basic products like candles and soap are running scarce. But it gets worse because the Germans are also running very low in animal fat. And that's absolutely essential in the manufacture of nitroglycerin explosives. Yet the Germans still have plenty of nitroglycerin for their guns and bombs. And that begs a question. Where on earth are the Germans getting all this material from their munitions? Well, it can't be coming from abroad because the blockade has stopped that. And it can't be coming from animals because they're running dangerously low on animals. 
So where's it coming from? In April 1917, the Times breaks a story that appears to answer the question in the most gruesome way imaginable. The Times quotes an account from a Belgian newspaper saying that there's a factory at a place called Everingcor which is producing a quite extraordinary stench. The Germans call it a Kadaververwertungsanstalt, a corpse factory. And the Times claims that the German army is boiling down their own dead bodies to produce fat. The story creates a furore in Britain. It's clearly an appalling situation, and questions are asked in the House. But although it gets as far as Parliament, the government very, very clearly dodges the issue. It doesn't want to engage with it. And then people also point out that cadaver in German doesn't necessarily mean corpse. It can also mean an animal body. So where are we with this? Does this mean that it is just animal bodies being burnt in this factory, or could this factory actually have a much more sinister purpose? The Times follows up with a second story that leaves very little room for doubt. It produces a piece based on an interview with a German prisoner of war that says the German army is indeed boiling down its dead to produce fat. The Germans are boiling down bodies, human bodies, for fat and for munitions. And he goes on to say that he and his friends actually call their margarine corpse fat because they believe that's what it's made out of. They believe that they're eating their own dead comrades. Now, this story takes the whole thing a stage further. The Times says that bodies are transported from the front line on trains to these great corpse processing facilities. The corpses are strung up on a chain, then passed through a bath of disinfectant and eventually moved through into a drying room. They're then actually dried and then they're put into a big vat. Where they're boiled down and they're hit repeatedly with paddles until they're nothing but a sort of corpse soup. Fat is rendered from the bodies then used to produce nitroglycerin explosives. And if there's one thing the Germans aren't short of, it's hundreds of thousands of bodies. When you look at it from a practical point of view, it actually makes a lot of sense. What do you have plenty of? Corpses. What do you have very little of? Fat. And you need fat to continue the war. So with that equation in mind, what do you do? You use the corpses to make fat, because after all, the people themselves, they're not going to complain, they're gone. And in fact, you could say that once again, they're serving Germany. But these soldiers have died bravely for their country, and now they're reduced to this? This is horrendous. The grisly story sends shockwaves round the globe. Resolve against the Germans hardens throughout the Allied world. This is such a grisly revelation that it has the power to turn neutral countries against Germany. It is yet another nail in the coffin of German fortunes, leading to Germany's surrender one year later. But in 1925, long after the war has ended, comes a new revelation. In 1925, Austin Chamberlain makes a statement in the Commons in which he says that the corpse stories were based on a false report. It turns out that the Foreign Office was behind this hugely successful piece of war propaganda. Conservative MP John Charteris was head of intelligence at the Foreign Office in 1917. In 1925, Charteris is overheard claiming that he fabricated the corpse factory story. Now, he says what he did was to switch the captions on two separate photographs. One was a photograph of dead animals being taken by train to a cadaver factory. The other was a photograph of dead soldiers being taken by train to their graves. He realized that all he needed to do was switch the captions around to make it look as if it was the human bodies that were going to the cadaver factory. But when this story is reported, Charteris denies it all. Now, having made this admission, Charteris then retracts it 
he says he never did it at all. In fact, what had happened was that he was talking at a society dinner in New York, trying to impress the Americans. He was boasting about the fact that he had come up with this story. And he'd been overheard by a journalist. A miss is then reported. What he then says is, no, 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 no. I, I, I was merely trying to entertain my audience. Was he covering his back? Did he make it up? Or was it disinformation? In 2017, a photograph is discovered in a collection of Foreign Office files at the National Archives, which adds to the mystery. That photograph shows bodies being loaded onto a train, and that photograph is from September 1917. And underneath is written for propaganda purposes. It may well be that this is the photograph that Charteris was talking about that was used to appear as though the Germans were boiling down bodies. The photograph was sent from Charteris at MI7, the military's propaganda unit, to the government's director of information, Lieutenant Colonel John Buchan, who would later go on to write the 39 steps. But the timing of the photograph doesn't match the original story. The original story came out in the Times in April 1917. The photograph is actually dated September 1917. So is it possible that Charteris was actually reacting to the story rather than the other way around? Whatever the truth behind the German corpse factories, their sinister influence lingers into the next war. When stories begin to emerge in the 1940s that Jews have been turned into soap in concentration camps, it's dismissed as fake news. In fact, one British intelligence officer even says it can't be true, it's just too similar to all these stories we heard after the first war. It's worse than you might think. Some historians believe that the Nazis got the idea of turning humans into fat in the extermination camps from the idea of the corpus factories from 1917, which is initially British propaganda. The story of the German corpse factories haunts the future, casting a dark shadow that can never be erased. You could say that this is the tale of the boy who cried wolf, only the wolf turned out to be more horrific than anybody could ever have imagined. Coming up, what do you do if you know your fortress is going to fall into German hands? Six men would stay behind in that cave for one final mission. The entrance to this cave is buried under tons of rock. They are simply trapped underground. They are buried alive. Imagine being buried alive. Once you're sealed inside, there's no way out. Not for days, but for months on end. If the cave isn't recaptured within 12 months, everybody inside will die. And your only two options are starvation or the firing squad. If the Germans never manage to capture them, they're going to starve to death. At the height of World War II, six men volunteered to do just that. But why? The men are sealed into their grave. What a way to end the war. By the end of 1941, Hitler's panzers have rolled triumphantly across Western Europe. Only one small foothold on the continent remains in Allied hands the Rock of Gibraltar. It only covers two and a half square miles, but it's of huge strategic importance. Gibraltar sits at the narrow mouth of the Mediterranean into the Atlantic. It allows Britain to control who enters and who exits the southern seas of Europe. This gives Britain control of traffic between Britain and America and India and the Far East. It's the most important trade route for Britain, bar none. And if it's lost, then that is absolutely disastrous for the country. 
Hitler knows how vital Gibraltar could prove. Smarting from his defeat in the Battle of Britain, he believes that conquering the rock is his best chance of vanquishing the British once and for all. What Hitler decides to do is basically choke Britain's trade with the empire. And that means taking three locations, Suez in Egypt, Malta in the Mediterranean, and Gibraltar at the mouth of the Mediterranean. The key to this strategy is the rock of Gibraltar. If Germany can take Gibraltar, then of course this really opens up the Mediterranean to German warships. Aware how much is at stake, the British prepare for German attack. They evacuate the rock of all civilians. They construct an airstrip. The naval base, already equipped with 36 big guns, doubles its firepower. The narrow spit connecting Gibraltar to Spain is mined, and a fleet of 33 ships is moored in the harbour, waiting and watching for the Nazis to advance. Beneath all these defences is this huge network of tunnels buried deep within the rock, some 34 miles long, and it can house a garrison of 16,000 men for about 16 months. The defences are strong, but the British know that they may not be enough to hold off a concerted Nazi assault. They make plans for one final mission in the event of a total German invasion. It remains one of the most macabre military secrets of the Second World War. Operation Tracer is a secret plan developed by British High Command. The aim is to ensure that even if the rock falls to the Germans, British presence will remain in Gibraltar. Near Ares Battery, at the heart of the massive network of underground tunnels, the British carve out a secret chamber. It's about 44 foot long, 16 foot wide, and about 8 foot high. And it's intended for six men to last for an entire year. Should the rock fall to the enemy, six men would stay behind in that cave for one final mission. Two narrow tunnels, just big enough to crawl through, lead out of the cave to concealed lookouts in the sheer cliff face of the rock. One points west across the Bay of Gibraltar. The other looks eastward across the Mediterranean. These two lookout posts are a brilliant vantage point for the men of the Stay Behind Cave. With complete concealment, the Stay Behind party can watch what's going on and report back on exactly how many ships the Nazis are moving at any time without the enemy having any idea this is being done. It will not be a comfortable stay. Conditions in Stay Behind Cave are really very basic. There's a toilet, there's a 10,000 gallon water tank, and there's a radio room. And any power they have is either generated through a hand crank or through an exercise bicycle, which is the only exercise that these men will get. But the lack of provisions is not the worst aspect of the mission. The entrance to this cave is buried under tons of rock. Now, that means that the Germans will never find it. It also means that anybody inside simply cannot get out. They are trapped underground. They are buried alive. The men have got enough supplies in the cave to last them for exactly one year. Now, during that time, it's hoped they're going to be rescued by the Allies. But if they're not, and the Germans never manage to capture them, they're going to starve to death. Six men are chosen for this high-risk mission. Two doctors, three signalmen, and an executive officer. One recruit, Surgeon Lieutenant Bruce Cooper, is told simply that his superiors are looking for a doctor to do something special. He knows nothing about Operation Tracer until he agrees to be recruited. 
Cooper and the rest of the team are put through a really intensive training exercise, uh, the most important element of which is how they're going to get on for a year trapped in a tiny space together. They're also informed about how to survive under these conditions by one of the people who was on Scott's failed expedition to the Antarctic, which must have really cheered you up no end. What a bloke to train them. Never mind, by the middle of 1942, the training is finished and Cooper is ready to go into the cave if needs be. Fortunately for them, the expected German attack on Gibraltar never happens. And the defenders of Gibraltar have an extremely unlikely ally to thank for their reprieve. The key point to taking Gibraltar is very straightforward for the Nazis. Three things have to happen. They have to have their forces in Africa facing Gibraltar. And even if they get this, they have to have enough time, energy, men and material to be able to put down a siege. They also have to have access to the north of Gibraltar through Spain. Which at the time under Franco is neutral, although friendly. By the end of 1942, none of these things have come to pass. Rommel's been defeated at El Alamein, so he's in full retreat. Secondly, the war on the Russian front was vastly using up Nazi resources. Millions of Nazi soldiers have been drawn off to the east. They are not available for attack on Gibraltar. And Franco is not allowing the Germans free passage through Spain. Ironically, Franco, the man who sympathizes up to a point with Hitler, is the sticking point. He is preventing the Germans from taking Gibraltar. It's pretty ironic when you think of it that the reason why the British didn't lose Gibraltar is because of the Spanish. Stay Behind Cave is sealed off and the team trained to occupy it stands down. After the war, the cave is, is forgotten. It's not actually discovered until 1997. And at that point, cavers get into it. It's amazing. And they, they try to work out what it is. And eventually, it's established it's this stay behind cave. No one believes it. And then Cooper, who's still alive, age 93, steps out of the shadows and confirms it's true. Cooper goes, yeah, we were trained for it. We were ready to go. It just was never used. When the story comes out, it becomes clear that Stay Behind Cave was not the only bolt hole the British Army was preparing in the event of an occupation. We know that there are other man-made Stay Behind Caves built in Malta and in Aden in case that these places fell to the enemy. But of course, it makes you think, how many other of these caves exist? Perhaps there's still a lone British soldier in a cave at Singapore looking out and marvelling at how advanced Japanese ships have become over the years. Or, then again, perhaps not.